successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't. Oftentimes, it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere when, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. Make a choice. Right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. Because it's only about 1% of people have the ability to really take risks, entrepreneurial risks. 99% of the population can work for a business once it's established. Only 1% have the courage and the ability to actually make the entrepreneurial breakthroughs that create those jobs. Somebody said to me, what did you learn from your father? And what I learned from my father is that work can make you happy. It really can make you happy. But you have to love what you do. You're meeting your must, my friends. Maybe it's time to change your must. Some people's must is to survive. Some people's must is to be okay. Some people's must is to have freedom. Some people's must is to have more than they can possibly spend. Some people's must is to take care of everybody around them. Whatever your must is, you're going to get it. Think how your life would be different if you raised the standard of what you expected from yourself. Not your people, yourself, to that level. How things could shift. It's all about changing your shoulds to musts. It's all about going back and saying, this is how it's going to be. an unfair advantage you know I went to war and at, at war I'm alive because other guys died for me when you see stuff like that you know how can I quit most guys are just wimps pussies cowards they don't have it. you know in the beginning we went to every single label and every single label shut their door on us um, the, the genius thing that we did was we didn't give up The guy who is willing to hustle the most is going to be the guy that just gets that loose ball. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that.
wrote myself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered, and I gave myself uh, five years, or three years, maybe. And, uh, and uh, I dated it Thanksgiving 1995. And I put it in my wallet, and I kept it there, and it deteriorated and deteriorated and stuff. And, uh, and, uh, but then, just before Thanksgiving 1995, I found out that I was going to make $10 million on, I think it was Dumb and Dumber. Maybe. Dumb and Dumber, yeah. When a seed is planted in the ground, all you can do is water it. You cannot control the sunshine, you cannot control the weather, and you cannot control what the locusts will come and try and destroy it. All you can do is plant your seed in the ground, water it, and believe. That is what allowed me to be in this position right now. I would not stop believing. mistaken why it'll never work um, you know but if you really believe passionately in what you're doing just just um, uh, you know keep going you know keep, keep pushing on keep pushing on and and, and then if, it, if you don't succeed pick yourself up and uh, and you know try again and, and and ultimately you know if you you know if you're that determined you will succeed in life This is a major opportunity. This is a major lifetime event for you. In all of the years that I've been doing this, only one person has quit, quit, left. I've been amazed that there's only been one person because some people and sometimes you really suffer. It's very tough. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing and it's totally true and the reason is uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, and you don't really love it, uh, you're gonna give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society, and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful love what they did. So Okay, we're live. Hi, my name is Rita Moore and this is Belinda Todd. And we are so excited about this event today. We have them planning and we have so many things that we're going to bring forth today. They will really help you grow in any way. <laughs> grow with your business, grow personally. We just have so many things in store for you today. Now this is called the Social Media Live Summit and is being sponsored by the Public Access Producers Association. Now let me tell you just a little bit about Public Access. Belinda and I have a show. How long have we had that show? Oh, what, we're eight years now? It's eight years? Fine Living Today. Fine Living Today. We come on every weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 5 p.m. It's local in Richmond, Virginia, and I know that everyone watching is not just from Richmond, but Public access is really expanding. What we want to do is just do things locally and connect with other local stations, public access stations, so that we can do things like this more often. Have people from all different states get together and share what they have. 
Public access is just where you can go locally and share what's on your heart, share things that are of concern to you. If you are in a particular community where there are things going on that you feel the community is not aware of, you can come to public access. You can go there, produce something, put something together, and just let people know that you're out there, which makes it a benefit to business owners, a benefit to local organizations. You want people to know you're there, public access is no charge. So public access, since we're expanding and we want people to know about what's going on with public access, we've decided to just sponsor this event where we will feature locals and some people from out of, out of town that will come and let you know things that will help you expand your business. Well, how would you describe what we're doing today? Well, this is a fantastic opportunity. And first of all, Rita, I want to congratulate you because this is your brainchild. You have uh, <laughs> just worked diligently to put this together, and so we're expecting a really fun day. Yes. The purpose is to have people come in today, talk about their businesses, the things they've gone through. There will be not only opportunities to tell about how to get into business, but also where, how do you take your business to the next level? There will be lots of inspirational moments, I'm sure, so you want to make sure you've got a pencil and, and pad with you, because I am sure you're going to get some nuggets today that you're going to want to think about a little later on. Um, let's talk about some of our lineup for today. Wow, I didn't bring the full lineup. Let me get that lineup. Let's see. The types of speakers that we're going to have. We have inspirational speakers. We have social media experts. Let's see, we have, wow. Uh, and one young lady is a, a poet, uh, uh, playwright as well, and she's very interesting. Uh, later on today, Imaja Jubilee. Yes. Uh, some of the other names I recognize, but I'm excited about our first speaker. So do you think we should um, introduce him and get on with the show? You want to do that? Okay, let's do let's that. Do that. We'll do talk that. later. We'll be here. We'll be sharing many, many different things. So, yes, I will get started. I will go ahead and introduce our very first speaker. Now, first, let me tell you, I'm a Toastmaster. It's going to come out, so I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> I'm a Toastmaster. I love Toastmasters. I found my voice when I found Toastmasters. That's right. And that was in the year 2000. Belinda and I started with the, we both charter members That's of Faith Talk Toastmasters. Faith Talks, yes. And we're still, I'm still in Toastmasters. I love it. Not that I feel that um, I didn't get everything I needed already from them. It's just that I want to share and help others. I exactly. want to serve others. Yeah, that's and your, the it's a ministry in a sense. Right, for right. Because just because I feel confident doesn't mean that I can't share that with someone else. I can help someone along. Well, I don't really need to help this next person. <laughs> you know, I almost competed against him, but uh, I lost in the competition long before I got to the level where he competed. But Breon. Oh, I gave his name away. I wanted to just shoot the name out at the end. But he is a member of my, one of my clubs, Faith Talk Toastmasters. And I'm going to read his bio so that I don't miss anything. He's a breath of fresh air. These are his yes, words. Yes, he is. <laughs> I agree with that. I agree with okay. that. He's a breath of fresh air to the speaking arena. As a certified business professional, he has subject matter expertise in leadership and professional development. Breon's mission is to inspire all people to use their energy, influence, and resources to create remarkable results in the world. Breon grew up in Portsmouth, Virginia. Where oh, he <laughs> that's where he received his greatest education, which is learning about resiliency of the human spirit. He believes that our greatest gift is the freedom to choose and create new possibilities in the face of adversity. Rion is available. Well, available for speaking engagement. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, he's also cute, but I don't think he's available, so <laughs> don't get your hopes up. Okay. okay, but in fact, I'm sure his wife is watching. Hello. <laughs> okay, but he is available for speaking engagements, for keynotes, for seminars, and for workshops. Now, he will share his, his website address with you. If not, I'll share it with you later. But let's yes. go right ahead and let well, us let welcome. Let me just go say ahead. too, before he comes on, that he's starting a new business. Oh, he Self-Reliance Consulting, where his motto is changing minds, changing lives. 
So I'm excited about what he's going to do and what he's going to share today. You see, let's just Linda welcome, welcome him. him. <laughs> come on, welcome. welcome. Come on, Brian. Come Good on. Good morning, oh, yes. This is like Toastmasters. Thank okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I start, first off, I would like to thank Rita, Belinda, and also LaDonna, Jason, who's working in the background. And also, you can see I have my pink on today, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, so I'm always a supporter of those individuals who's fighting breast cancer today. All right, today I'm going to talk about leadership and your ability to lead in an organization or as a business owner is very, very important. But today, there's low morale in the workplace and nine out of 10 businesses are failing every single month. There is a shortage of great leadership. And the question that keeps popping up is, where have all the leaders gone? Someone said to China with most of the jobs. <laughs> I've spent several thousand hours reading and studying about leadership, and there is a definite process to great leadership. And today, you're going to leave here with a better understanding of what true leadership is. Motivating others, building relationships, and simply becoming the type of leader that others will love to follow. I've discovered eight essential qualities that separates the average leader from the leadership master. The average leader, he can get people to do what's required, but only what's required. That leadership master, he inspires people to exceed expectations and deliver amazing results. The average leader, he only cares about the process. The leadership master, he cares about the people. He understands that if he adds value to the people, the people will improve the process, promote the process, or better yet, for business owners, buy your products. So with that being said, would you like to become a leadership master? Using the acronym, the acronym I Can Lead, you will discover these eight essential qualities and place yourself on an unbeaten path to leadership mastery. I logged on to Google this morning and I typed in what is leadership. And it gave me 1,170,000,000 results. That's a lot of information. But if I can take all of this information and just use one word to sum up what leadership is, using the I can lead acronym with the first letter being I, that word would be influence. The ability to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. To get a better understanding of how, how, how influence works, let's just think about TV commercials. We all must have the latest cell phone. You know, as soon as I learn how to send pictures and download apps, it's time for an upgrade. Some of us buy into that. You know, all women should be 115 pounds. So we, invest, so we invest $6 billion in the diet industry. You know, and all men should have a head full of hair. You know, I, I didn't buy into that, but some of us buy into that. And when you think about influence, we have that same ability as individuals to influence others around us. Whenever a group of people are together and there's a decision to be made, who does the group lean on for the decision? Whose opinion is most valued? That's the person with the most influence. So we must understand that influence is very, very important. We must understand influence because your level of success as a leader will always be determined by your ability to influence people. So using the I Can Lead acronym with the first letter being I, influence, understanding the power of influence. So how do we increase our ability to influence people? Listen on. The second essential quality is what the Greeks call the foundation of all other virtues, courage. When you have courage, you have the mind or spirit to face danger, difficulty, or pain without fear. I'm gonna repeat that. When you have courage, 
you have the uh, mind or spirit to face danger, difficulty, or, or pain without fear. I went to work for a chemical company in 2000. And at this chemical company, they had a system in place. You had a certain group of people doing the low paying work. You had a certain pe group of people doing the high paying work. And this system was in place since the 1970s. And because of courage, I overcame this system. I learned the process, earned the respect of my peers, and I was promoted to the lead man position. A few months later, the tank farm supervisor or the plant supervisor position came available, and I applied. Now, it was the regional manager's responsibility to promote the plant supervisor. He, vis he visited the facility that day, and he proceeded to give me an on-the-spot interview. As we were touring the facility, he began asking me questions. Breon, I take it you have a degree in petroleum engineering. I said, no. Well, it must be chemical engineering. I said, no. Electric. Environmental safety? No. Chemistry? No. Is it biology? No. He stopped in his tracks. He turned. He looked at me. He said, Breon, well, what type of degree do you have? I don't have a college degree. He went on to ask me more questions. Well, have you ever supervised a group of, a group of people uh, 40 and over? No. Have you supervised a crew of 35? No. How about 25 people? No. Do you have 10 years of experience with the business? No. No, 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 no. He stopped. He stared at me for a moment. He said, Breon, we can't hire someone like you. You don't even have the educational requirements. He shook my hand, walked away, hopped into his car, and drove off. I was devastated. Have you ever worked your butt off for an opportunity that you knew was right for you? just to see that opportunity handed to someone else. I went home that night and I began to think things over. And even though I was devastated, I needed to possess the courage to keep pressing on. And I needed a way to change that no to a yes. And so this next essential quality is important, attitude. It is your attitude towards life that would determine life attitude towards you. So even though I was devastated, I needed to maintain a positive attitude. And the first thing I started doing is upgrade my wardrobe. Every day I went to work looking more impressive and better than a plant manager. I would have won a best dress ribbon every week. And I always displayed confidence and I always displayed a positive attitude. And a lot of times in life, we don't know how we're going to get the results we need. All we need to do is believe that those results will occur. And that's what having courage and that's what having a positive attitude is all about. So one day, the plant manager had took the day off. And all of a sudden, three SUVs rolled up, pulled up onto our facility. It was the Department of Defense and also the Department of Transportation. Now, this government agency has the ability to shut down our facility at a, at a moment's notice. They got out of the car, their vehicles, and they began walking towards me. I displayed courage, I displayed confidence, and I displayed a positive attitude. Now, whenever the Department of Transportation arrived at our facility, management began shaking in their boots. They were afraid of the Department of Transportation, as if there were the big bad wolf. They walked to me and they were heading in my direction, so you know, I acted as if I was a man, I dressed as if I was a man, so they asked, are you the man in charge? Why yes, I am the man in charge. They said, hey, we're here to audit your business, okay? I learned all the processes, learned all the pre procedures, and I learned all the programs. So I was ready for this internal audit. 
and after eight grueling hours, the audit was a success. Then all of a sudden, the next day, the regional manager visited our facility. He congratulated me for doing a great job and to offer me the plant supervisor position. I said, since you are interested in hiring someone like me, the cost of my services has gone up 25%. <laughs> and it was because of courage and it was because of a positive attitude that I made these things happen. And a lot of times when it comes to courage, it doesn't mean we're invincible, but what courage does is it makes us able to hop up much faster after a fall. And it, when it comes to a positive attitude, your attitude will always determine how far you grow and how far you go in life. Always have courage and always possess a positive attitude. This fourth essential quality is no excuses. Now, if you're the type of person that likes to complain when setbacks occur, listen on, this next story may help change your way of thinking. In 1907, the World's Fair visited St. Louis for seven days. And during this time, the waffle business and the ice cream business flourished. There was this couple who wanted to invest in the waffle and ice cream business. So they went and purchased seven days worth of waffles and seven days worth of ice cream. They were ready to make money. But they made a mistake. They purchased two days worth of plates. And after the second day, no one would loan the vendors, this couple, any plates. No one would sell this couple any plates. So they went home that night upset about the decisions they made. And the husband, he began complaining and criticizing about everything and everyone. He was asking his wife, how could you let this happen? How could I let this happen? You know, how can we let this happen? Complaining, complaining, criticizing, and always looking for someone else to blame about the mistake they made. The wife, she sat there quietly, ironing her clothes. The husband said something about that. You know, how could you sit there ironing your clothes when we're about to lose everything? She sat there quietly. She understood the power of silence. The answers will always come to you in silence. She stood up, walked into the kitchen, grabbed a waffle, brought it back to the ironing board, and began to iron that waffle. The husband couldn't understand, didn't understand what was going on. What are you ironing waffles for? She just sat there quietly, ironing her waffle until this waffle was nice and flat. Then she began to roll the waffle up until it had a cone shape at the bottom. Then she went and grabbed another waffle, and she did this a thousand times throughout the night. And on that night, the ice cream cone was invented. The next day, they went on to sell out five days worth of product in one day. And the rest is history. And the moral of the story is this. We all make mistakes. Mistakes are a natural part of life. Admit your mistakes and learn from your mistakes. <clears throat> criticism. There are two types of criticism. Constructive criticism and destructive criticism. Constructive criticism is feedback that's designed to help you. You may not always like it, but it's designed to help you. Destructive criticism is a malicious attack that's designed to hurt you. So be careful how you criticize. Last but not least, when setbacks occur, go grab an ice cream cone and think things over. <laughs> All right, the next quality is listening. Listening is critical. You can go to any business today and you can ask the employees, what is your biggest problem here? Most of them would say, communication. We have ideas, we have concerns, but no one is listening. When I got promoted to the plant supervisor position, the first thing I did was establish a weekly meeting. 
This gave the employees a voice in the decisions. We generated more ideas, and we also improved the business. And I had, to lot, I had a lot to learn when it came to listen. But two valuable pieces of information I, was all, I, I left with was when you want to be a better listener, do these two things. Ask a question about what you just heard, or quickly summarize your material and repeat it back to that person. This way, you're creating clarity. It shows that you accept their information, and you're also building respect. So listening is very, very important. It's critical. The next quality is empathy. Seeing it the way they see it, feel it the way they feel it, and thinking about it the way they think about it. In other words, putting yourself in their shoes. One way to build empathy when you're communicating with a person is always by making the statement, tell me more. This way, you're building a bond of communication with that person. Empathy, always empathizing with, thing, with individuals. Very, very important. The next quality is appreciation. At the end of the day, we all want to be valued for who we are, what we are, and what we do. That's what Mother's Day is all about. That's what Father's Day is all about. That's what Memorial Day is all about. That's what Veterans Day is all about. Making people feel valued for who they are and what they are. Always find ways to congratulate people. Always find ways to recognize people. Develop your own recognition program if you can, but always find ways to make people feel valued for who they are and what they are. One other way to appreciate people, to improve the process, to make people love you, like you, totally respect you, is practicing the law of reciprocity. And the law of reciprocity states that if I do something for you on a consistent basis, you in return would do something for me. So always find ways to do things for people. The leadership master always find things to do for people. The average leader always find opportunities to get things. So at the end of the day, everyone wants to be respected, everyone wants to be valued. And a person will give their love, time, and money to an individual that can give them the value that they need. If you do these things, you're gonna like the results, I can guarantee it. The next element or essential quality is development. Always find ways to get better at what it is you do. I wanted to become a better speaker, so I joined Toastmasters. On April 4th, 2009, I left that Toastmasters meeting and I was excited about Toastmasters. And on that night, I began working on my first speech. Preparing the speech, no problem. Rehearsing the speech, no problem. The idea of presenting a speech in front of a group of people that I barely even know, Houston, we've got a problem. Two weeks later, one hour before the start of the Toastmasters meeting, I'm sitting in my car, and I begin having that internal dialogue. You know the type of dialogue you have when you start second-guessing yourself? What was I thinking? No one knows you're here. Turn the call on. Let's just go back home. No, I can't go back home. I haven't even started yet. So I closed my eyes. I said a short prayer, and I went inside. Fifteen minutes prior to the start of the Toastmasters meeting, I went from my seat to the restroom, from the restroom to my seat, from my seat to the restroom, from the restroom to my seat. I did this a total of five times. I was so overwhelmed by the nervousness and the fear. You know, I've done audits, I've given presentations at work, but this was about me using my imagination and using my creativity. My name was called. I stood up. My throat began closing up on me. My mouth was all dry. My hands, they were, they were filled with perspiration. And I'm thinking to myself, just lick your hands. But that wouldn't be appropriate. I went on to present that icebreaker speech, that first Toastmaster speech, and I did it. 
I received praise and admiration from the Toastmasters group, but I didn't like this feeling on the inside. I didn't like this feeling of fear and nervousness, and I had to do something about it. And anytime I want to learn something new, I go to the rule of three. I read at least three books on that particular subject. So I read books like 10 Days of More Confident Speaking, The Speaking Secrets of a Motivational Superstar, and World Class Speaking. And then after that, I learned that anytime you speak in front of a group of people, you are in the business of sales. So I read books like The Psychology of Persuasion, Soft Selling in a Hard World, and How to Win Friends and Influence People. And the list goes on and on and on. Along with reading these books, I reached out to every community. I gave speech after speech, gaining more confidence, gaining more comfort, and gaining more courage. And it's funny, one of the, the clubs I would always visit was Southern States Corporate Headquarters. They would always ask me, Breon, we in Georgia speeches, when are you coming back? I went back and I eventually joined that club. And I went on to represent them in the International Speech Contest. And the first contest was on the west end of Richmond. We were doing a short meet and greet. And one contestant was a lawyer. One contestant was a sale manager. Other contestant was a district manager. And, and here I stand, you know, a guy working at a manufacturing facility on night shift. But do you know what happened? I won that contest. Yes, you did. And quite a few others. Craig Valentine, the the author of World Class Speaking. I spent eight hours in a hotel room being coached and mentored by him. And at the end of the day, he said, Breon, I think you have what it takes to be successful in the business of speaking. Now, I don't know if he was being honest or if he was saying these things because he was still, I was still holding on to that $1,000 check of his. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what happens. You know, I had to spend $1,000 for his services. And at the end of the day, we can't always ask, my, ask ourselves, can I afford it? We need to ask ourselves, can I afford not to invest in myself? That's the key. All right, back to the speaking competition. You know, 500,000 Toastmasters, 100,000 contestants from 25,000 clubs across 81 different countries. And it has come down to the final 500. And I was one of them. You know, all the books I read, all the people I've met, all the clubs I've visited has prepared me for this very moment, the International Speech Contest at the district level. My name was called. I walked onto that stage, and I'm staring out in front of a huge audience. And I felt, I felt at home. I didn't win that contest, but I left a champion at heart. And when I think about, when I think back about that experience, when I thought about how I developed myself along the way, the experience was rewarding. Working on your own development. And that's what this I Can Lead acronym is all about. You know, working on your own personal development, building relationships, and working on your own personal development. Now, I do have a deeper breakdown of the Accolade acronym. You can actually visit my website, brianmills.com. You can go to the contact page. And the first 10 or 15 people that email me requesting this CD or this information or this audio book, I'll send it to you for free. All right, brianmills.com, B-R-E-H-O-N-M-I-L-L-S.com. Thank you. Woohoo! Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You, we're coming at you. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Both you. sides. Okay. I'm excited. I'm excited because um, if this young man says you can do it, he's a personal testimony that you can do it. I believe in him. Thank you so much. Those were interesting stories and some kind of funny. <laughs> We're going to uh, introduce another speaker to you. Uh, well, you know, what do you think, Rita? I think we need to put on another motivational video. All right. What do you think? <laughs> okay, before our next speaker comes up. Right, right. right. Give, give everybody a breather, and uh, we'll, we'll surprise you with our next speaker. You have no idea who it's going to be. <laughs> we'll, be we'll be right back. We're going to go ahead and put on one of those motivational videos. The Persevere. When, you know, when it got really tough. 
and and the ones that looking in call somebody tell them to log in to www.socialmedialivesummit.com and if you're on Facebook go ahead and click the link and tell everybody I'm watching Social Media Live Summit tune in just go ahead and click the link that says post on Facebook let them know what you're doing right now great okay we'll be back shortly didn't love it quit because they're sane right who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it so it's a lot of hard work and and it's a lot of worrying constantly and uh, um, if you don't love it you're gonna fail make a choice right you just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. Because it's only about 1% of people have the ability to really take risks, entrepreneurial risks. 99% of the population can work for a business once it's established. Only 1% have the courage and the ability to actually make the entrepreneurial breakthroughs that create those jobs. Somebody said to me, what did you learn from your father? And what I learned from my father is that work can make you happy. Really can make you happy. But you have to love what you do. You're meeting your must, my friends. Maybe it's time to change your must. Some people's must is to survive. Some people's must is to be okay. Some people's must is to have freedom. Some people's must is to have more than they could possibly spend. Some people's must is to take care of everybody around them. Whatever your must is, you're going to get it. Think how your life would be different if you raised the standard of what you expected from yourself, not your people, yourself, to that level, how things could shift. It's all about changing your shoulds to musts. It's all about going back and saying, this is how it's going to be. Have an unfair advantage you know I went to war and at, at war I'm alive because other guys died for me when you see stuff like that you know how can I quit most guys are just wimps pussies cowards they don't have it you know in the beginning we went to every single label and every single label shut their door on us um, the, the genius thing that we did was we didn't give up The guy who is willing to hustle the most is going to be the guy that just gets that loose ball. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that.
wrote myself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered, and I gave myself uh, five years, or three years, maybe. And, uh, and uh, I dated it Thanksgiving 1995. And I put it in my wallet, and I kept it there, and it deteriorated and deteriorated and stuff. And, uh, and uh, but then, just before Thanksgiving 1995, I found out that I was going to make ten million dollars on, I think it was Dumb and Dumber. Maybe. Dumb and Dumber, yeah. When a seed is planted in the ground, all you can do is water it. You cannot control the sunshine, you cannot control the weather, and you cannot control what the locusts will come and try and destroy it. All you can do is plant your seed in the ground, water it, and believe. That is what allowed me to be in this position right now. I would not stop believing. mistaken why it'll never work um, you know but if you really believe passionately in what you're doing just just um, uh, you know keep going you know keep, keep pushing on keep pushing on and and, and then if it, if you don't succeed pick yourself up and uh, and you know try again and, and and ultimately you know if you you know if you're that determined you will succeed in life This is a major opportunity. This is a major lifetime event for you. In all of the years that I've been doing this, only one person has quit. Quit. Left. I've been amazed that there's only been one person because some people and sometimes you really suffer. It's very tough. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing and it's totally true and the reason is uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, and you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society, and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful love what they did so they could persevere. When, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. Make a choice, right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. Because it's only about 1% of people have the ability. We're back. You are tuned into Social Media Live Summit.com. And today we have a roster of inspirational speakers, of people in business who are going to help you not only develop your business, but take your business to the next level. There may be some people out there today who had just have a desire that I want to start a business. So today, we hope that you will get information to help you move to that level. 
my, our next speaker, I'm excited about him because um, he is also a local man, went to Norfolk State, which is one of my favorite schools because my husband is a Norfolk State grad. Spartan. Yeah. Uh, a Spartan, yes. But you live now in Richmond and you are very busy. Yeah. Not yeah. only have you written a book that I'm very interested in, in uh, reading myself, this is Finding Chris, My Father. Uh, I'm sure that as you talk, you will tell us a little bit more about this. Mm -hmm. All right. And not only that, but it's been made into a play that's going to be presented in November here at the Children's Theater in Richmond, Virginia, November 17th. That's exciting. You uh, are an author. This is not your only book. No, you have how many more? Three. Three more. So he's going to be showing you those. Uh, in addition, that one of the things you have a business, your business is life, love, religion, publishing. Because I have read that you think that everything in life will fall under these categories. Is that correct? Okay. All right. He's done very, many outstanding things in the community, including speaking. He has worked for Mayor Dwight Jones Youth Academy uh, in marketing and recruitment for Virginia Mentoring Partnership as a VISTA worker, and um, he is a youth counselor. So he's got lots of life skills to present to us. Without further ado, I welcome you, Thank Vincent. You. Appreciate the it. stage is yours. All right. Thank you, everyone, for taking your time and tuning in. I uh, just wanted to speak to you all briefly about uh, building your brand, about business, about uh, especially about writing and writing books and, and networking and things that can help you enhance your business. Um, a lot of the people that may be watching here may be thinking about starting a business or have already started a business, but you may be wondering, how do I market myself? How do I build my brand? How do I get more people involved with me? How do I get people to notice me? And sometimes it can be strategic uh, movement in regards to how you get that done. And sometimes it can, just, it can just happen if you be in the right place at the right time. And what I want to do is just explain to you First, give you my testimony of how everything happened, and then show you some things I've learned along the way. Even talk about some mistakes that I've made. Um, and as she stated, um, I actually have a few books that I've written. But like I said, I want to uh, backtrack a little bit and talk about the testimony of how everything started to happen, and then show how I began learning um, different methods and learning from my lessons and my mistakes. Learning lessons from my mistakes. Uh, my first book um, is entitled "The Fully Seasoned Man's Relationship Recipe." A very long title, so I say it again: the fully seasoned man's relationship recipe. And how that this book came about was in 2009. I was working at the Richmond Department of Social Services, and I was just uh, talking to a lot of my coworkers. There is a very big department, and I noticed that a lot of the women in that department were dealing with several issues regarding men and, and things that men were doing to them they didn't feel were appropriate. And being that I was at one point a man that was doing those exact same things, they say game can recognize game. Well, I was able to recognize what those men were doing. And I, st I started noticing that the pattern was getting so, um, the pattern was happening so often that I decided to go home and I started writing about it. And I have, I've never taken any writing classes or any book classes, but I decided to come home and just write about my testimony in regards to how I was helping out all these women with the same issues because I could recognize what the men were doing. So I went home and I wrote the book. I started writing on the book every day. I wrote on it while I was at work, while I was home, and I just constantly wrote on the book. And all of a sudden, I ended up turning the book into self-publishing the book. And my goal for that was just to write the book to maybe inspire you know, a, a few women out there. I did not know that writing a book, I would start doing, uh, get calls for speaking engagements, for radio um, interviews and things of that nature. And when it goes to building your brand, you want to make sure you get your name out there. You want to make sure that you uh, market your product. You want, if you have a service, you want to put that service out there. Every chance you get, utilize every outlet possible. Once I created my book and I saw that I could do more with my book just than help a few people, I started, I started, as they say, going hard or hustling. I started doing that. I started putting my book's name out there um, on Facebook, on social media, on Instagram. I started uh, cutting and pasting chapters from my book, just enough to get the people's mouths wet a little bit so they can inquire about the book. Um, from there, I started reaching out to all the radio outlets, uh, doing radio interviews with um, online radio as well as regular radio. I started doing uh, events at various areas, speaking about my book, 
doing Q and A's, question and answer, um, at, at different lo different localities in, in Richmond and Tidewater area. And I noticed that my book started to get bigger and my buzz started to get bigger. So I created a website. And I mean, this is 2013, but even back in 2009, you definitely needed to have a website. I created a website, and just to let y'all know, in case you may say, well, I'm starting a new business, I don't have enough money. There's free websites, there's WordPress, uh, there's Wix, there's all kind of different website, uh, websites out there that you can build for free and maintain, and you don't even have to be tech savvy to be able to maintain it, upload your picture and your, your bio, and you can have it where they can buy your book offline, online and everything. So don't get discouraged because you're just starting your business and think that you don't have enough money, because trust me, I was in that same boat, and I was able to create a website, build a brand, create books, get a cover made and everything, and this is with a low amount of money being able to do this. So it can be done. Um, and from there, the book started gaining momentum. I was doing radio interviews and, and, and speaking engagements. And I said to myself, I said, I don't consider myself a writer because I haven't went through the proper channels to become a writer. And in 2007, and meanwhile, I'm going through all this in 2009, but I still was dealing with some issues of not meeting my biological father and having some abandonment issues and some questions in my head and just going through a lot of personal things. Even though on the outside, everything was looking like it was going well. So to rewind to 2007, I met my biological father. And at meeting him, it was an amazing thing. I never thought I would meet him. So it was like my world was turned upside down in a good way. And, and I progressed forward in my work. I wrote books and everything, but I still wanted to tell my story. Um, so in 2010, I began recalling all events of how everything happened from my childhood to meeting my father. In 2010, even though I told myself I'm not a writer, I started to uh, write about finding Chris, my father. His name is Chris, Chris Anderson. So I thought it would be appropriate title to call it Finding Chris, My Father. And what I did was I started scribing um, different events that stood out to me in regards to growing up in my youth and especially interacting with my father. So the book Finding Chris My Father is actually dealing with not just find a uh, memoir about me finding my father, but I'm, I've actually written it so that it can help all people out here that, that, that are dealing with the issues of today, today that we uh, have to interact with in regards to um, abandonment, identity crisis. When I say identity crisis, I'm not talking about you not sure what your identity is. I'm talking about um, a man will will follow after his father, but if there's no father to follow after, then you know you may be dealing with identity crisis then. At a state of abandonment, the big issue that plays in the African American community is fatherlessness. Um, you definitely want to research that um, word fatherlessness because it's an epidemic that I'm sure is not affecting you personally, it's affecting your next friend or next two people over in your life because it's very huge, especially here in the Richmond, uh, Virginia area. So I'm a person, I've worked in, as she stated in the introduction, I've worked with youth and with um, young adults my whole life from working at Intercept Youth to Virginia Mental Partnership to Department of Social Services to the Mayor's Youth Academy. I'm always working with youth and I tell my story. A lot of people, when they heard I was writing a book about my father, it was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as transparent as you're doing. I wouldn't tell my, I wouldn't tell my information like that. But I'm, I'm believing that you're overcome by your testimony. And if I tell my testimony, I have saw how it's affected other people. In my first book, I was very transparent, talking about how I was maneuvering in an inappropriate manner with women. And then I talked about how I turned that around and I, and I started moving towards the righteous uh, methods of, of my, and, and letting, letting God guide my steps in regards to how I maneuver with women. Well, it started helping other men that I knew that were in the same boat. It started helping women that were dealing with these men, but they weren't able to recognize, as I call them, the wolves and sheep's clothing, they weren't able to recognize those type of guys. But once they read my book, they were writing me on my website. They were talking to me. They were saying, you enabled me to avoid this type of heartache and, and et cetera. So my testimony, even if people were to uh, criticize me, my testimony helped other people, and that's what I'm about. So in writing my book, Finding Chris, My Father, I started to recall, I said, well, let me not just write about my father, but let me recall what, I've, what I went through in my lifetime, because I know there's some young boys or some young girls out there that's dealing with the same thing. So I, in my book, Finding Chris, My Father, I actually talk about um, growing up dealing with fatherlessness and dealing with those things I mentioned earlier, abandonment, identity crisis, and even bullying. Bullying is a big thing here in 2013, but it's been going on since way back. Um, so in my book, I actually talk about my story, personal memoir, um, and it may sound like a movie if y'all happen to read the book or hear about it, but everything is all true. I grew up thinking that a, another uh, gentleman was my father. Um, signed my birth certificate and 
and everything. And I grew up with him, but he was in and out of jail, so I would see him for months. Uh, and then sometimes I wouldn't see him for months or years, but I always knew him as my father. Um, I was even taken to the jail where he was, and I would visit him. But when I was young, my mom didn't really want to tell me that I was going to see my father in jail. You know, she didn't want to really put that uh, perception in my uh, heart. So she would tell me I was going to visit him at school. Um, and I know a lot of people would, I know whenever I told that story, people would laugh or say, school is jail. But um, if you haven't visited anybody in jail, there's, there's I mean, there's, uh, there's schools in there. There's uh, areas where you can go and, and see them interacting with books and you can sit with them face to face, no bars, none of that. So I actually, I, was, I would go very often and visit him. I never saw any bars or anything. Um, I mean, you would think they would ring a bell if I saw the bars, but I, I didn't see any. So I was interacting with him off and on, but mainly I was raised by my mother, my grandmother, and my aunt. Um, and I hear a lot of young men say that the reason that they went left in life was regard, regard to having no father, and they got into the streets and gangs, but I had a very solid foundation um, in spite of you know lacking a uh, father. I had my mother and my grandmother and my aunt, they were very strong. But I didn't learn about manhood. I didn't have anybody to teach me how to ride the bike and to fight and all that. I had to learn that stuff myself. So in growing up later on, when I turned 16, my mother sat me down and said, son, I'd like to tell you something. And she was crying, and I could tell everything was bothering her. And, I, and so I was concerned. Actually, I'm going to take it back. At 14, she tried to tell me. I wasn't as mature to be able to handle something like what she's about to tell me. She told me that my father was not this person that I thought it was. I got up and stormed out of the room. Um, but then two years later, she sat me down, and it's, it's a wonder what uh, two years makes a big difference. Um, she sat me down. She said, I want to try to tell you this one more time. I feel like you're ready for it. She said, your father's name is Chris Anderson. And even though she had tried to tell me two years ago, it, it still blew my mind because even though I had a love-hate relationship for this man that was in and out of jail, uh, the love part was strong. He was my father in my eye. That's all I knew for 16 years. Now she's telling me he's not my father. And I have a biological father out there somewhere. All I have is a name, Chris Anderson. Um, so it, it blew my world. We got into another argument, and I was just all kind of questions popping in my head. And I was just, I felt abandoned. I felt like everybody had lied to me. I even tried to go as, to the extreme of disowning my, fa my, my stepfather's side, I guess you could call him, disowning them, even though I knew them my whole life as my family because I didn't feel like everything, I didn't feel like anything was real. That's when I started getting anger and, and just dealing with all kind of issues that your child or your cousin or your brother or your sister, anybody may be dealing with right now. You may be wondering why are they lashing out? Why are they acting so angry? Um, why are they not you know, uh, disclosing information to me? Well, you never know what's going on in their world. And even if you're there in the home with them every day, you might want to start asking them questions. Are you comfortable with the fact that so-and-so is not here? How are you feeling? How are you doing in school? You got to ask those questions because you don't ask those questions, people harbor that anger and that frustration, that confusion inside of their hearts. And that's what I did. Um, I was, I've always been very good at covering things up when I'm dealing with something. So a lot of my friends that read my book was like, I didn't know you were going through any of that, but I was. Um, and, and that's the reason why young, especially, and I, I hate to put an uh, emphasis on African Americans, but I just, this is how, I'm an African American, I like to relate to them. And a lot of my young brothers and a lot of the kids that I mentor are running around here angry. And you can't, some you can't tell, some you can tell. If you look in the jail cells, you can tell who may have been angry, but there's many out here that were not, that, were, that are good at covering up like I was, but they're still dealing with issues. Those are the ones that we need to reach out to, and that's why I write a book like Finding Chris, My Father, um, to be able to hone in on those specific areas that people aren't speaking about. Sometimes even in the churches or in the communities, they need to be, um, to be spoken on. So that's what I do in my book, even if it means opening my entire world, my family, my life and everything, and, and trust me, I've dealt with all types of criticism, but I know that there's a higher purpose in the reason that I write a book like Finding Chris, My Father. So um, to bring the story on a, in a nutshell, basically, at 16, I found out my father was not my father, and I knew I had a biological father out there. All I had was a name. That's it. No pictures, no faces, no nothing. Um, so I go along, and I'm angry, I'm confused, but I'm still in school. I'm in high school doing well. I go off to college, and I actually tell myself, a lot of people let a situation like that turn, deter them and turn them left or make them start going to gangs, etc. I flipped it. I said, I'm going to be the best person that I can be so that whoever this person is is my father, they're going to regret that they never met me. So I go to school. I go to undergrad. I do well at Norfolk State University. Um, after Norfolk State University, I'm, and when I was at Norfolk State, I still, even in the midst of me doing well, I was still feeling confused. 
whenever my mom would bring up my father's name, I would lash out on her and yell at her. And me and my mom were very, very close, growing up still very close. And we could talk about anything. But once I found out about that one issue, that was what we bumped heads all the time. So much to the point where when I turned 21, when I was in uh, Norfolk State, I actually changed my last name from the person that I thought was my father to my, uh, my grandfather and my mom's last name because I knew that they were my blood, whereas this person, I, I was, even though he signed my birth certificate and I thought he was my father, I realized he wasn't, we didn't share the same blood. And I didn't know my biological father, Chris Anderson, for me to change it to his, so I went with what I know. So I changed my last name to White, um, my middle name to Ellis, because my grandfather's name was Ellis, and all my family in Southside Richmond and everybody knew us as Ellis White. So that's what I did. I felt very secure with doing that. That made me feel at ease, but I still had an issue because I didn't know my father. Um, graduate Norfolk State, I move on, I'm working, I'm doing all kind of great things. And in 2007, I'm not going to tell the whole story because you got to, you know, get the book. But uh, <laughs> two, in, in 2000, that's a shameless plug, right? Uh, in 2007, uh, basically my mother um, went to go visit my grandmother that was sick in the hospital. And I was going to visit her every day. I'm going to show you how amazing God is. I was going to visit my grandmother every day because we're tight just like me and my mother are. Keep in mind, they all raised me. Um, so I'm very protective of them and everything. So I go to visit my grandmother every day. This one particular day, I did not go visit her, but my mother did. And my mother ended up running into my father that she had been looking for like my entire life. And she just ran into him in a local hospital that's here. Um, and it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, but she didn't tell me. So at Christmas time, 2007, uh, we open the gifts, me and my brother, and everything's going like normal Christmas time, but my mother hands me an envelope, and she says, I want you to open this on your own, go in the bathroom and just open this, and I'm sorry. And then I just, I didn't know what it was going to be, because keep in mind, we hadn't really mentioned Chris Anderson since I was 16. I've been dealing with it, and, and his name had been popping in my head every day. It's a very common name. I saw it everywhere. Uh, every time I saw it from 16 to 27, I would look and just try to, you know, figure out what could that be him. But anyway, I go in the bathroom and open this note, and she's explaining to me, I'm sorry, you know, I know we have a close relationship, but it's one thing that if I could, you know, everybody makes mistakes, even parents, and one thing I regret, and I've just held guilt, and I've had to go to God with, is the fact that you never knew your biological father, I never told you his name. And she basically explained that she was dealing with my biological father, but then they split, and right after they split, she got pregnant, she made a bad decision, as parents do, as people do, and decided not to tell me. And she met this new man, the one that I thought was my father, and he kind of he, he kind of coerced her to say, "Look, I'll take care of him, and don't worry about it." And definitely not the right thing to do at all. Um, I don't want to speak on that too, but uh, that's what happened. And I was led to believe that he's my father. But glory to God! Um, at, in 2007, she met my father. She had been searching for him and everything, and I was harboring anger for my previous father and for my current father. I thought he left me. But she put in the book that she never told him. She was pregnant after he left, but she never told him that um, he had a son. So I'm gonna tell you something amazing. Like I'm reading this paper and I'm just reading it and I'm getting angry because I'm like, why are we talking about this? I'm still angry about not having my father. I turned the page and she said, but glory be to God. She said, I was walking through the hospital visiting your grandma and I walked past this man and right away his face looked very familiar to me and I stopped him. And she said, and I realized it was Chris Anderson and when I just saw his name, she had it in the book, I just dropped the book. And I just burst into tears. And I was just like, oh my God. I never thought I'd meet him. I didn't have any pictures. I just thought I would be angry about it forever. And I just dropped the book. I couldn't believe it. And after I got myself together and I picked the book back up, I read it. And she said, <clears throat> I ran to Chris Anderson. She said, and as I told you, he never knew about you. So not only would I have to present you to him, I could present him to you. So she was like, I grabbed her shoulder. And I said, hey, do you remember me? And she said, I'm Belinda White. And he remembered her. And she sat him down. She said, this is going to sound crazy, but I had your son 27 years ago. So I want you to imagine that as a father hearing that or as a parent hearing that. And then imagine a son reading that on Christmas Day. That was my Christmas present given to me was my biological father that I had been hoping to meet but never thought in a million years I'd meet him. She wrote down his cell phone number and, you know, came up there and we did the whole hugging and crying and everything. And I was scared to call him on Christmas Day. I had my son with me and everything. So, like, the next day I called uh, him on his cell phone 
He said he was working at the hospital. I, he asked me to come on down. I took my son down there to meet him. And it's, I was just down there. I was just rocking back and forth, just nervous. And the elevator door opened up, and I looked at him. I said, that's him. I, he looked just like me. And I, and I, and I, I knew it was him. Um, and so I don't want to give the whole story. I want to stop there because I, 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 she talked about a play as well. Um, so I want you all to picture that. Let, that. let that thought marinate in your mind for a minute. And she's talking about a play. And I'm talking about building your business. I wrote this book. And I wrote the book for me. End up, the book started doing well. People started loving the book and the message and everything. I started doing speaking engagements, not even about the book, but about fatherlessness and that, and that upbringing that I told you about, and meeting my father and, and, and giving people hope they could find their father. One day, two guys that were at my book event said, we love your story, we'd like to make it into a play. I thought they were playing with me. I said, okay, you know, take the business card, kept it moving. Um, but they kept in contact with me. They asked for a copy of my book. They started writing scripts, and I said, this thing might be for real. Um, and, they, and, and a year went past um, to 2011, 2012, and next thing you know, we got a script. We're doing casting in Richmond and Tidewater and Williamsburg, and everything became official. And I was just thinking to myself, I said, look at God. I was like, I, I grew up angry, confused. You couldn't tell, but I know I was dealing with all those things. I know a lot of these young men that I mentor and I interact with that deal with a lot of these things. And what the devil meant for bad, God just turned into good. It ended up going from me dealing with all these things and, and society statistics would show that I'm supposed to be having no degree, being in jail and the whole nine. But I went to school, got my undergrad degree, got my graduate degree, worked in all types of you know um, wonderful fields, mentor, give back. But also I met the man that I thought I'd never meet it helped me get rid of some of the anger. I was still dealing with some, but it helped me get rid of some of the anger. It helped me answer some of the questions. And it also helped bring out one of God's gifts that he had down inside of me, which is writing not one, but two and three books, um, and finding Chris, my father. But I said, I want to reach more people. So when they asked me about the play, I thought the play would be great, because a lot of people like to get a visual. So now we start coming up with a cast. And to fast forward 2013, we now have a play that we've done in the Tidewater area that had a great response. People actually requested for me in my hometown. I'm born and raised here in Richmond. We're having it at the um, the Children's Theater of Virginia at uh, Willow Lawn, November 17th at 4 p.m. And I'm definitely excited because it's coming to my hometown. And also, this is where I grew up. This is where I wrote the entire book about because this is this is where my upbringing happened. So I got my play coming out, and I always tell my testimony first because I tell people if you if you rewind back to 2009 and ask me what do you plan on doing with this book, I'd never think it would get this far. But that's how God works because you, you might have a plan and then God's plan will just, you know, just tackle your plan and just, and just let you, that's why you, can, you know, you gotta just put everything in God's hands because when you're doing right or when you're doing it and it's in God's will, it's gonna happen regardless. 2009, I was just gonna write a book, that was gonna be it. Well now I got three to four books, I have five to six books on my jump drive that I'm working on right now. So now I think I safe to say I can call myself a writer. Um, <laughs> And like I said, that book, I finally kissed my father. I just wanted to write it for me. It was like, like therapy. Well, now it's become therapy to other people. I've had grown men stand up at my speaking engagements crying, and I just couldn't believe it. Crying, saying, I still can't find my father, or this is what I've been dealing with. This is the reason why I went this way or that way. Grown men, all different age brackets, from 20 to 40, 60 and up, I've seen it all. And I knew I used to sit and break down crying. So don't let these men tell you that they're not dealing with no issues. And they don't shed tears because they do. They just do it, may do it behind closed doors. But they, I had people standing up, speaking, testifying. That's why I knew this book was going to be big. And that's what I want to do with the play. I want to reach more people. And that's why I'm excited. We have it. We had it in Tidewater. We're having it here in Richmond. And and telling about where God takes you. Um, I had a guy approach me the same way that they approached me about the play on my uh, finale for my play in Portsmouth. A guy approached me and said, "How would you feel about making this an independent movie?" I said, glory to God. So let's, let's keep it going. Um, so I said, sure. You know, I'm not going to turn that down. So uh, in 2014, we're going to start working on finding Chris, my father, turn that into an independent movie. Um, and who, who knows where it's going from there. But now I don't even make plans anymore. As you can see, never thought I'd find my father. Never thought I'd get through some of the hardships I went through uh, growing up. Never thought I'd write one book, let alone two, three books, let alone a play, let alone a movie. So I want to let you know in regards to building your business, um, First of all, seek God in all that you do. And once you do that, 
um, lay a plan out, but let, but just have it in your mind that that plan can definitely change if it's in God's will. And I feel like if you're doing the right thing, if you're on a righteous path, then God will continue to order your steps. And your whatever your business is, product or service, it will continue to grow and flourish and flourish. But you got to do the work too. Faith without works is dead, so you got to do your work. So I was, I always was a hustler. I was able to go out there and hustle on social media, get out there and talk to people. People always ask me, where can you, where can I get your book? I tell them the right thing. You sure you can go to you know BarnesandNobles.com, Amazon.com. But after that, I say, but if you want it right now, it's in the back of my car. <laughs> um, so. You want to make sure you have that inside of you. Be able to hustle it hard. I don't want God's not going to give you a gift and then you, you halfway, halfway yourself through it. So you want to make sure that you really go hard. Uh, build a website. Build a brand. Always put your name out there. Always put your book out there. Whatever your purpose is behind your product or your service, do that. Get on radio stations. Speak and engage. Even if it's not for money, get out there anyway. Because I've done stuff that wasn't for money or wasn't for profit, but I've met people later on that have invited me to their church, to their ministry, to their radio show. And six months later, I sell 20, 30 books with them. So it's about networking. Make sure you network and you build your brand. Tell people about your story. I tell my story all the time. I want to embed it in their brain. So in regards to just bringing it back to building your media, building your brand, I want you to understand business. I understand that business is all about the gray area too. It's not just black and white, but as you can see, there's a gray area and there's different ways to build yourself and prepare yourself. Um, I hope you're able to take a message, a lesson from that message as I have, and I continue to learn about myself even as I hear myself speak now. My book is called Finding Chris, My Father. Um, you can definitely get on Amazon.com, BarnesandNobles.com, um, and in the, in, the, in my trunk near you, I guess, you know, you can say it that way. Um, but uh, my, my play is coming November 17th at the Children's Theater of Virginia, so definitely look that up. My website is lifeloveregion.com, and once again, I am Vincent Ellis White. Thank you. Oh, Stay there. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just say again, wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I, this, I feel like it was like an hour. I'm sorry. No, it, it wasn't. It wasn't. And um, how interesting. Well, first of all, have they cast a part of your mother? Yes. Because my name is Belinda. <laughs> oh, see, I wish I had known you. Yeah, let, let, me, let me just tell you this, though. That's this is interesting name. because as you said that, um, so many things I want to say. One is that what an inspiration to young people who are in a similar situation, right. whose hearts are hardened because they have these issues that they mm -hmm. have not resolved, and they cannot be, um, they cannot reach their potentials. They cannot be all that God wants them to be right. because they have not resolved all of these internal things going on with them. I understand exactly where you're coming from. I did not know my biological father. And unfortunately, he died before I ever got to meet him. But only in um, last year did I find out that I had two brothers that I didn't know. So as you talk about your testimony, I'm with you. It's mm -hmm. not just a man thing. It's yeah. women as well. Yeah. And it trips you up in life. It and does. it causes you to, to do and be all that, that that's un-God-like. Right. And so, wow. Yeah. Thank you I, so I found much. Out, I mean, I'm still finding cousins, and, mm -hmm. and I have an older brother. Um, I have a nephew who's 18. I still have to meet. So I'm still finding family members now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'm 33. I'm still finding family members now, so that that excitement is still there. Yeah. Um, and yeah. but uh, but also and it took me that, twice as long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the things you mentioned is true. Like I told you, I, I got rid of a lot of the um, mm -hmm. anger, but. I would be lying if I said I don't still have some issues at yeah, 33 yeah. now, all of because because yeah. of my upbringing. So. And I see you, he brought you can't see him, but there is an adorable mm -hmm. young boy. How old is he? He's seven years old. Seven. What's his name? Jordan Ellis White. Jordan Ellis White. Yeah. Uh, so certainly the way you parent is, yeah. is a lot different. Yeah, I'm saying those those because that know me. Of your experience. Yeah, those that know me out there, um, I I I love. Uh, being a father, I take my son everywhere yeah. um, to my speaking engagements. Uh, he he tells me all the time, Daddy, I'm selling your books for you in school. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, he, and, we, and when he says that, he just tells his teacher, and he's just so proud. So he's telling yeah. everybody about my what books. What a wonderful example. Um, yeah, I, and I think, like I said, you can turn the situation around. A lot of people, that when they grew up without a father, they end up not being there, but that doesn't have to be the case. Mm -hmm. I, I make sure I'm there above and beyond. The same with with uh, growing up without one. They statistics show you're supposed to be in a gang or in jail or yeah, dead, but yeah. you know, by God's grace, I'm still Glory to God, you know, yes, yeah. yes. Well, listen, we're gonna get Rita up here while we go to the trunk. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so let's do that. $16. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You really did a great job and it really blessed me. I really did enjoy you. Thank you. I appreciate okay, it. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. And look, look, Belinda, pick up one for me, okay? As a okay, okay, okay. I'll pay you later. Okay. <laughs> okay, now we have to set up for the next person that's about to come up and speak. What I'm going to do is put on my favorite video again. You know, and that plus it'll give us a, a chance, the folks here, to really talk about Vincent, Vincent's presentation. I personally enjoyed it. It took me to another place. My father is one of 13 children, and his brothers and sisters all had 13 or more children. And so I'm always meeting cousins and friends. And I actually, I, I used to work for the telephone company many years ago in a, what they used to call public offices. Maybe I'm giving away my age because public offices have been gone for a while. But he, see, where his, see where his story took me? took me back to years ago when I was working in a public office and a young lady came in that public office and said to me, I'm your sister. Really? <laughs> and it turned out she was my sister. But I didn't know that. You just never know what's going on out there. I just, I don't know. Put it that way. I had no idea that I had other sisters. I have enough already. It's 11 of us. <laughs> but now I found out it's more. But I'm going to be quiet now. We, I'm going to go talk to Vincent. And we're going to set up for the next speaker. And while we're setting up for our next speaker, you're going to hear my favorite motivational video one more time. We'll talk to you in a few minutes. Really take risks, entrepreneurial risks. 99% of the population can work for a business once it's established. Only 1% have the courage and the ability to actually make the entrepreneurial breakthroughs that create those jobs. Somebody said to me, what did you learn from your father? And what I learned from my father is that work can make you happy, really can make you happy. But you have to love what you do. You're meeting your must, my friends. Maybe it's time to change your must. Some people's must is to survive. Some people's must is to be okay. Some people's must is to have freedom. Some people's must is to have more than they could possibly spend. Some people's must is to take care of everybody around them. Whatever your must is, you're going to get it. Think how your life would be different if you raised the standard of what you expected from yourself. Not your people, yourself, to that level. How things could shift. It's all about changing your shoulds to musts. It's all about going back and saying, this is how it's going to be. fair advantage you know I went to war and at, at war I'm alive because other guys died for me when you see stuff like that you know how can I quit most guys are just wimps pussies cowards they don't have it you know in the beginning we went to every single label and every single label shut their door on us um, the, the genius thing that we did was we didn't give up okay ladies <laughs> We're back. Okay, welcome back, welcome back. I'm glad you're hanging in there with us and this is the Social Media Live Summit and we're doing so many things to help you grow. Grow your business, grow personally and we'll, we'll bring people that will be introducing or uh, talking about social media um, after we're through uh, introducing people that are involved in so many different things that we need to learn more about things that are of interest to everyone. What I, ha I have in front of me right now is what I have are two books. One is called Lost Foundation, 
from Foster Care to God's Heir. And it's by Nina Fitzhugh Wells. Did I pronounce that correctly? Absolutely. Okay. And the other one is I Didn't Know. And that one is by Yvette Allen Tatum. I didn't know, extra, 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 the truth must be told, identifying, identifying, confronting, and overcoming child abuse. Now, if those aren't topics of interest, I don't know what else could be. I'm going to just give a brief outline of both of these young ladies before they start talking. Nina Fitzhugh Wells has served in the publishing business for nearly 15 years and in education for more than 25 years. Her calling and passion is for teaching, counseling, reaching out to help others. Now God has commissioned her to educate and inspire, to offer people hope and healing to the lost and those that are hurting. She's going to make a presentation today and talk to you about those that are hurting, foster care, is that right? Absolutely. Okay. And we also have Yvette Tatum. Her book is called I Didn't Know. Yvette is an author, a teacher, an advocate, a conference host, a public speaker, an encourager, a motivator. She's an ordained minister of the gospel. <laughs> She's radical for Christ. And the list goes on. <laughs> you can do it all. Praise God. Gifted, gifted, gifted. She's a mighty woman of God, and she's blessed with grace, intelligent, and a prophetic teaching anointing. I'm going to leave it there, and I'm now prepared to introduce to you Yvette Allen Tatum and Nina Fitzhugh Wells. Take over, ladies, and share with us what you have to share. Thank you. I didn't write my biography, somebody wrote it for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, thank you for having us here today. I'm Yvette Allen Tatum, and I'm here with my co-host, friend, and publisher, Nina Fitzhugh Wells. And we have a radio station on Blog Talk Radio called Revelation for Elevation. And the purpose of that show is to raise awareness about foster care and specifically about um, those foster care children who have aged out of foster care or emancipated from foster care. And we're also using that um, program as a platform to raise awareness about child sexual abuse as well. And so we also are bridging those two dynamics some people may think that they're separate, but there actually is a bridge between them because many of our foster care children, unfortunately, uh, they may run away and they may end up on the streets. They may fall subject to child abuse, child sexual abuse, human trafficking. And then unfortunately, some of our children um, are not necessarily placed in the best of homes and they may experience child sexual abuse in those settings as well. So there really is a connection between the two dynamics from which we're coming from. Nina with foster care, myself with child sexual abuse. Uh, as we were introduced, they introduced my book, I Didn't Know, Identifying, Confronting, and Overcoming Child Sexual Abuse. And the whole golden aspect of this particular book was not only to expose child sexual abuse, but to make people aware of how prevalent it is, why children may not know or their parents may not know that their children have been sexually abused, and also to try and debunk some of the myths about child sexual abuse. And I also have all that information listed in my book. The book is very small, but it's very power packed, and that's just not my opinion. Um, I've gotten wonderful reviews so far from the book as I'm currently on a, a virtual book tour. One of the myths that I like to bring up about child sexual abuse that people often overlook or have a misconception about is it says that normal appearing, well-educated, middle-class people do not molest children. That is a huge myth. In fact, I can tell you two of the people who reviewed my book, one of them uh, found out that two of her college classmates are currently incarcerated for child sexual abuse. Now these people are college educated, middle class individuals, 
married and have children of their own. So that dispels that myth right there that well-educated people do not molest children. And oftentimes, unfortunately, they reach out to children that they know. That's another myth is that uh, we have strangers or stalkers or that people indiscriminately abuse or offend our children. Statistics show in 90% of cases, our children unfortunately know their abusers or their offenders. Unfortunately, it happens in our homes sometimes where it's the parents or an uncle or aunt or cousin. Um, it could be the football coach, as we know with the stories that happen at Penn State. It could be, a, unfortunately, a minister, a child care provider, any number of people. Unfortunately, no one is really excluded from the potential of being an abuser of our children. And so we just want to raise awareness about this, bring these facts out. We want to give a voice to the voiceless, our children. And believe it or not, children do not tell or come forward as often as people think they do. As such, a lot of these cases go unreported. A lot of our children never get the help that they need. In fact, during the whole entire month of October, we've been using our show to raise public awareness about child sexual abuse. And we've had several guests to come on the show, and many of them have not reported these cases to their parents or whoever their caregivers or guardians were. And they are only now coming forward as adults to share their story, which I find to be a tragedy. And that's another piece of what I share in my book is I, the abuse itself is bad enough. Um, the children having to carry the burden of sharing this story or really hiding the story within them and not coming forward is bad. But I also think equally as bad are people who stand by and they keep silent about this. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, people know what is going on in a particular person's home, um, and they don't come forward. They don't want to tell. Unfortunately, we've heard that saying, what happens in our house stays in our house, and that's not always a good thing. And so I think that's just as bad as the offense itself is someone attacking our children. And that's what I wanted to share about child sexual abuse. I don't want to take up too much time and not allow Nina an opportunity to speak. Yes, and let me also mention before I speak about my book and my um, platform is that Yvette's doing fantastic things all over the world. I mean, she's been on a dynamic book tour and in great demand everywhere she goes. Um, this is a, these are very delicate subjects that we're speaking about. You know, foster care, you know, a lot of people don't really, they, they know there's foster care. They know foster care exists, but they really do not know or understand a lot of the things that take place in a child's life that affect them as adults. And child sexual abuse is one of the main issues that they have to deal with. And I say have to deal with. Because when you're snatched away from your parents, for whatever reason, maybe good reason, bad reason, but if you're snatched away from your parents and placed with strangers and then forced to live um, in um, conditions that include child sexual abuse, imagine what that can do to the psyche of a child. Imagine what that could do to the development of a child. Imagine what that could do to the future of a child. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people frown upon those who are in prison and those who have mental issues and those who are prostitutes and those who are drug addicts and alcohol abusers. But I, I can tell you, as much as I've worked in the field with this population, about 70 to 80 percent, if not more, have been through the foster care system. Um, I worked in a, a, a psychiatric pavilion here in Richmond for a little while, and I worked with the adolescents there. And about 90% of those young people who were in the psychiatric hospital were in foster care. Um, I chose to, to, to um, be an advocate for this uh, cause because I am myself um, a product of foster care. 
I spent 16 years in the foster care system. I was abandoned by my parents at the age of two, and I was placed in the foster care system, moving from home to home, and was emancipated at age 18. And what it means to be emancipated, it, it basically means that you are cut off from all state support and you are virtually left on your own to fend for yourself. Uh, they, the state social workers do what they need to do, but once you turn 18, that's it. Now back in the, in the 70s when that happened with me, I was virtually left with no support. No family, no other means of support, and basically I was left on my own to make it. No housing, often I was homeless, often I was hungry, um, often I had no clothes to wear and would resort to stealing. I mean, I literally stole to survive. Uh, and so to someone who doesn't know anything about that, they would be like, oh, she's a thief. Uh, but what they didn't understand was I needed to live. I needed to survive, I needed to eat. Um, so whatever I had to do, lie, steal, cheat, I had to do it to live. Um, and so being aged out of foster care, uh, it, it does put you in a position where you don't have any means. No checks coming from the state, no help coming from anywhere. You can't even get on welfare because you don't have a job or you don't have a permanent address unless you have a, a number of children, you know, you're pretty much on your own. I had none of those. Um, and so I was left out to fend on my own. The reason I wrote this book was really this was my deliverance. And I have, I tell everyone, and if you're listening today and if you're watching today, I tell everyone, please, writing is very therapeutic. And you can write your way out of your pain. You can write your way out of, of your mess. You know, and you really, really can. And so I started writing. I started writing. My anger was awful. My trust was less than zero. You could tell me something, and I would look at you and not believe a word you said. If you told me that you loved me, I didn't know what love was, because love was being beaten. I was in a foster home where it was a very loving foster parent. She was sweet as she could be. And she would dress me and my sisters up really nice. But when she drank, she turned into a different person. And she would beat us unmercifully. And it was very hard at seven, eight, nine years old to be able to equate this loving woman with beating. Okay, love means beating. Love means hurting. Love means, you know, today you'll love me and you'll dress me up pretty and you'll make me feel really good. And tomorrow you might beat me down so bad that I can't move. And so these are messages that are being fed into children, into our young people. And so then we develop relationships that, okay, the worse you treat me, the more I think you love me. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, well, how can you be in an abusive relationship? How can you be in a situation like that? It's the only life I know. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing I know. Nobody has told me that love doesn't hurt. No one told me that love doesn't mean that you're not going to walk away from me. Because that's what love means. Love means you leave me. Love means you say you're going to be there but then you're gone. That's what foster children endure, you know, every day. And so the, the lack of trust, you know, um, the lack of feelings, the inability to attach, and then there's the flip side of having an attachment disorder. Mm -hmm. Don't leave me, don't be mad at me, don't hate me. And I experienced all of that. Panic attacks and so forth. There was a lot that I endured in my young life and had to go through a lot of serious help, you know, to get to the point where I can sit here before you today and share this story so that someone else can get free. So I wrote this book, and I'm going to read what it says on the back so that you can have an idea of what this book is about and why I wrote it. It says, you are invited to journey with Nina Fitzhugh Wells as she sacrificially becomes transparent to show you how faith can turn any situation around. After struggling for years to be delivered from her past, Nina emerges victorious as she presents Lost Foundation, her profound autobiography to the world. As a ward of the state of Pennsylvania from the age of two to being emancipated at the age of 18, Nina shares her testimony of how being abandoned by her birth parents and the foster care system, 
she was forced to learn to adapt and survive. Having no means of support, guidance, or love, Nina learned the code of the streets and played the game well, and I did. I knew the code and I knew how to play it because it was about survival. Um, survival was her motive by any means necessary. She was lost deep in the sin of her past and sunk even deeper as she struggled for acceptance. Foster children often will do anything to get you to love them, mm -hmm. to get you to accept them, to keep you from leaving them. Don't leave me. Don't abandon me. That's just the way it is. And so they'll do anything to win your acceptance and your approval. And if you don't approve of them, that can be disastrous. That's what leads the, to the drugs and to the alcohol and all the other abuses that exist. So she was lost deep in the sin of her past and sunk any, even deeper as she struggled for accepting, acceptance. However, after years of disappointments, <coughs> failures, and defeats, she cried out to God to lift her from her pit of shame and hurt. And right there I'm going to say this to you. For me, if it had not been for the Lord, and I have to say this, I would not be here today. I found myself in some very, very serious predicaments and situations. And if it had not been for a savior, if it had not been for something greater than me, I would not have been here today. Um, I cried out to God, and he lifted me up. And he helped me find him. And that's where I started changing. From that point forward, my foundation became sure, my faith stabilized, unconditional acceptance and love manifested in my life, and now I am free. I'm the owner of a publishing company. I'm the founder of a nonprofit for other uh, children who have aged out of foster care, and I help people to write out of their pain, write your way out of your pain. So. From abandonment to struggle to survival to activist to author and educator, I'm sharing this with you guys to bring some much needed awareness and transformation, um, not just to the kids, but also to the system, because the foster care system is, off, is very broken and it needs help. And so we need you guys to get on board, help us to spread the word about how much is needed. These young people need counseling. These non young people um, need um, someone to advocate for them. They need housing, they need a place to live. The simple things, when the dorms were closed, when I was in college, when the dorms were closed, I had nowhere to live. I had nowhere to go, you know, so I had to hustle up on the weekend. So here I am at Penn State. <laughs> I did my undergrad at Penn State. At Penn State, um, but on the holidays, I was somebody else. So, you know, I'm just this student at Penn State. By day and by night, I'm, I'm making it happen. So, yeah, by any means necessary. So, foster kids, if you are out there and you don't know which way to turn, I encourage you to find someone that you do trust and call me. You know, contact me, ninafitzewells.com. And I'd be more than happy to help you, to guide you, to counsel you, to lead you to where you can get the help and the support that you need. My book, too, is available everywhere. And you can purchase it um, at just about any bookstore um, you know, across the nation and abroad. So if you want to read about my story, my experiences in the various foster care homes, my experience with coming out of it, and the struggles that I still endure each and every day, you know, trying to come back, come back and overcome um, some of the things that were planted in me years and years and years ago. So sometimes often because you're free doesn't mean that those things don't come back and rise up. And I think that we need to be sure that as we are spreading messages out here and advocating for various causes, that we let people know that there will be times that you may slip. And there may be things that you're not going to do perfect. But you just pick it up and you keep on going. And that's the basic message you know, of my book. It's not to say, well, I went through this terrible thing and now everything's great. Well, that's not true. The book says I went through this terrible thing and uh, things are great, but I'm still each and every day making it and making a better way. I encourage you to get a copy of this book, get a copy of I Didn't Know, 
um, social media has been wonderful for us as a way of advocating. Um, our Revelation for Elevation radio show is one of the primary ways that we get the messages out. We interview social workers, counselors, victims, survivors, thrivers. Um, we interview people, we interview each other, you know, and we continue to get the word out to the world. So I encourage you guys, if you're looking for resources, if you're looking for support, please, please purchase I Didn't Know or visit www.yvetteallentatum.com for more information. Lost Foundation from Foster Care to God's Air, www.ninafitsyouwells.com. Um, and tune into our radio show, which comes on every Saturday at 10 a.m. Revelation for Elevation is Block Talk Radio, so it's internet radio. Again, social media live. And um, tune in. If you have a story to tell, a story to share that you feel that enhances or supports our efforts, please contact us. We would love to have you as a guest on the show. And um, wow, Yvette, do you have anything else to add? Well, yes, they can contact us also at revelationforelevation at gmail.com. And we just, we welcome your information, welcome your stories, and we'll be glad to have you as a guest on our show to further support your efforts, either in raising awareness or helping victims to overcome. And I even interview an, uh, an offender in my book, and so we will also have some of those people on our show as well as they begin to start their healing process mm -hmm. as well. And also, if you have a story to tell, it's so, you know, the, the word of our testimony is so powerful to help other people see that they can come through things as well. So if you have a story to tell, please contact me. Um, I am the co-owner with my husband of Kingdom Publishing Group. That's www.kingdompublishing.org. And if you have a story to share that talks about how you've gone from the pit to the, the palace and, and that you're navigating every day to maintain in that palace, please, you know, look us up and consider us, you know, to publish your book. Uh, even if you need some tips and some guidance as you're trying to get started with writing your way out of your pain, please, you know, look me up, give me a call, send me an email. I respond very quickly and, you know, anything that I can do to help and support your efforts, I would be happy, happy to share it with you. Uh, wow, this has been a great medium, a great way of getting the word out to you and, um, Go ye therefore. Do what you got to do and, and make a difference in the world. Thank, Thank you, you, ladies. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. What wonderful testimonies. I really, really enjoyed hearing that. My goodness, I didn't even know how wonderful. <laughs> you know, we, we invite people. People are always willing to share. But this is why I also love public access, because this is what you find on public access. And Public Access Producers Association is sponsoring this event. These young ladies have testimonies that they're sharing to help you. And then you can share that with other people. They're available to you. They're opening their hearts. It's just wonderful. I'm really excited about what's going on here today. And I want to thank you again for coming. Thank, thank you, you very much us. for coming. And when we do this again, I hope you come back Absolutely. and share with us again. Oh, All right. Thank now, you. it's time again for me to play what? My favorite <laughs> motivational video. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. We'll be right back. Bye. Thank you. The guy who is willing to hustle the most is going to be the guy that just gets that loose ball. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. 
That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you gotta be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. wrote myself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered, and I gave myself uh, five years, or three years, maybe. And, uh, and uh, I dated it Thanksgiving 1995. And I put it in my wallet, and I kept it there, and it deteriorated and deteriorated and stuff. And, uh, and, uh, but then, just before Thanksgiving 1995, I found out that I was going to make $10 million on, I think it was... Dumb and Dumber. Maybe. Dumb and Dumber, yeah. When a seed is planted in the ground, all you can do is water it. You cannot control the sunshine, you cannot control the weather, and you cannot control what the locusts will come and try and destroy it. All you can do is plant your seed in the ground, water it, and believe. That is what allowed me to be in this position right now. I would not stop believing. passionate what you're doing just just um, uh, you know keep going you know keep, keep pushing on keep pushing on and 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 then if it if you don't succeed pick yourself up and uh, and you know try again and, and and ultimately you know if you you know if you're that determined you will succeed in life this is a major opportunity this is a major lifetime event for you in all of the years that I've been doing this, only one person has quit, quit, left. I've been amazed that there's only been one person because some people and sometimes you really suffer. It's very tough. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing and it's totally true and the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having really fun doing it, fusion offers so much for so little. Really love it, uh, you're going to give up, and that's what happens to most people. Actually, if you really look at at, at, at the ones that uh, ended up, you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society, and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did, so they could persevere when you know when it got really tough, and and the ones that that didn't love it quit. 
because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. Make a choice, right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. Because it's only about 1% of people have the ability to really take risks, entrepreneurial risks. 99% of the population can work for a business once it's established. Only 1% have the courage and the ability to actually make the entrepreneurial breakthroughs that create those jobs. Somebody said to me, what did you learn from your father? And what I learned from my father is that work can make you happy. It really can make you happy. But you have to love what you do. Your meat and your must, my friends. Maybe it's time to change your must. Some people's must is to survive. Some people's must is to be okay. Some people's must is to have freedom. Some people's must is to have more than they can possibly spend. Some people's must is to take care of everybody around them. Whatever your must is, you're going to get it. Think how your life would be different if you raised the standard of what you expected from yourself, not your people, yourself, to that level, how things could shift. It's all about changing your shoulds to musts. It's all about going back and saying, this is how it's going to be. unfair advantage you know I went to war and at, at war I'm alive because other guys died for me when you see stuff like that you know how can I quit most guys are just wimps pussies cowards they don't have it. you know in the beginning we went to every single label and every single label shut their door on us um, the, the genius thing that we did was we didn't give up The guy who is willing to hustle the most is going to be the guy that just gets that loose ball. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that.
wrote myself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered, and I gave myself uh, five years, or three years, maybe. And, uh, and uh, I dated it Thanksgiving 1995. And I put it in my wallet, and I kept it there, and it deteriorated and deteriorated and stuff. And, uh, and uh, but then just before Thanksgiving 1995, I found out that I was going to make $10 million on, I think it was Dumb and Dumber. Maybe. Dumb and Dumber, yeah. When a seed is planted in the ground, all you can do is water it. You cannot control the sunshine, you cannot control the weather, and you cannot control what the locusts will come and try and destroy it. All you can do is plant your seed in the ground, water it, and believe. That is what allowed me to be in this position right now. I would not stop believing. mistaken why it'll never work um, you know but if you really believe passionately in what you're doing just just um, uh, you know keep going you know keep, keep pushing on keep pushing on and and, and then if it, if you don't succeed pick yourself up and uh, and you know try again and, and and ultimately you know if you you know if you're that determined you will succeed in life This is a major opportunity. This is a major lifetime event for you. In all of the years that I've been doing this, only one person has quit. Quit. Left. I've been amazed that there's only been one person because some people and sometimes you really suffer. It's very tough. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing and it's totally true and the reason is uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, and you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society, and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful love what they did so they could persevere. When, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. Make a choice, right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. Because it's only about 1% of people have the ability to really take risks, entrepreneurial risks. 99% of the population can work for a business once it's established. Only 1% have the courage and the ability to actually make the entrepreneurial breakthroughs that create those jobs. Somebody said to me, what did you learn from your father? And what I learned from my father is that work can make you happy really can make you happy but you have to love what you do you're meeting your must my friends maybe it's time to change your must some people's must is to survive 
Some people's must is to be okay. Some people's must is to have freedom. Some people's must is to have more than they could possibly spend. Some people's must is to take care of everybody around them. Whatever your must is, you're going to get it. Think how your life would be different if you raised the standard of what you expected from yourself, not your people, yourself, to that level. How things could shift. It's all about changing your shoulds to musts. It's all about going back and saying, this is how it's going to be. unfair advantage you know I went to war and at, at war I'm alive because other guys died for me when you see stuff like that you know how can I quit most guys are just wimps pussies cowards they don't have it. you know in the beginning we went to every single label and every single label shut their door on us um, the, the genius thing that we did was we didn't give up The guy who is willing to hustle the most is going to be the guy that just gets that loose ball. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, then go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. myself a check for 10 million dollars for acting services rendered and I gave myself uh, five years or three years maybe and uh, and uh, I dated it Thanksgiving 1995 and I put it in my wallet and I kept it there and it deteriorated and deteriorated and stuff and uh, and uh, but then just before Thanksgiving 1995 I found out that I was gonna make 10 million dollars on I think it was Dumb and Dumber. Maybe. Dumb and Dumber, yeah.
When a seed is planted in the ground, all you can do is water it. You cannot control the sunshine, you cannot control the weather, and you cannot control what the locusts will come and try and destroy it. All you can do is plant your seed in the ground, water it, and believe. That is what allowed me to be in this position right now. I would not stop believing. Just don't take it for, for an answer. I mean, I think if you, you know, if you believe in what you're doing, um, you know, many people will tell you, um, you know, what, why you're mistaken, why it'll never work. Um, you know, but if you really believe passionately in what you're doing, just, just, um, uh, you know, keep going. You know, keep, keep pushing on, keep pushing on, and, and, and then if it, if you don't succeed, pick yourself up and, uh, and, you know, try again. And, 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 ultimately, you know, if you. You know, if you're that determined, you will succeed in life. This is a major opportunity. This is a major lifetime event for you. In all of the years that I've been doing this, only one person has quit. Quit. Left. I've been amazed that there's only been one person, because some people and sometimes you really suffer. It's very tough. People say, you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing and it's totally true and the reason is uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't any rational person would give up it's really hard and you have to do it over a sustained period of time so if you don't love it if you're not having fun doing it and you don't really love it uh, you're gonna give up and that's what happens to most people actually if you really look at at, at, at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't. Oftentimes, it, it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere when, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane, right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. Make a choice. Right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. Because it's only about 1% of people have the ability to really take risks, entrepreneurial risks. 99% of the population can work for a business once it's established. Only 1% have the courage and the ability to actually make the entrepreneurial breakthroughs that create those jobs. Somebody said to me, what did you learn from your father? And what I learned from my father is that work can make you happy. It really can make you happy. But you have to love what you do. You're meeting your must, my friends. Maybe it's time to change your must. Some people's must is to survive. Some people's must is to be okay. Some people's must is to have freedom. Some people's must is to have more than they can possibly spend. Some people's must is to take care of everybody around them. Whatever your must is, you're going to get it. Think how your life would be different if you raised the standard of what you expected from yourself, not your people, yourself, to that level, how things could shift. It's all about changing your shoulds to musts. It's all about going back and saying, this is how it's going to be. I have an unfair advantage, you know. I went to war. 
and at, at war I'm alive because other guys died for me. When you see stuff like that, you know, how can I quit? Most guys are just wimps, pussies, cowards. They don't have it. You know, in the beginning, we went to every single label, and every single label shut their door on us. You might not be able to hear me, but I just want you to know that we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. So our next speaker is going to be coming on on the phone. We'll just play the conversation, and hopefully that will work well for us. We're not able to bring them through on the line, so we'll see if this works. Let's just, I just want you to know, because I know you've been watching that same wonderful, inspirational video for quite some time, but we'll be back in about five minutes. Hope you can hear me. <laughs> Um, the, the genius thing that we did was we didn't give up. The guy who is willing to hustle the most is going to be the guy that just gets that loose ball. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is gonna hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. I wrote myself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered, and I gave myself uh, five years, or three years, maybe. And, uh, and uh, I dated it Thanksgiving 1995. And I put it in my wallet, and I kept it there, and it deteriorated and deteriorated and stuff. And, uh, and, uh, but then, just before Thanksgiving 1995, I found out that I was going to make $10 million on, I think it was... Dumb and Dumber. Maybe. Dumb and Dumber, yeah. When a seed is planted in the ground, all you can do is water it. You cannot control the sunshine, you cannot control the weather, and you cannot control what the locusts will come and try and destroy it. All you can do is plant your seed in the ground, water it, and believe. That is what allowed me to be in this position right now. I would not stop believing. I think if you
you, you know, if you believe in what you're doing, um, you know, many people will tell you, um, you know, what, why you're mistaken, why it'll never work. Um, you know, but if you really believe passionately in what you're doing, just, just, um, uh, you know, keep going. You know, keep, keep pushing on, keep pushing on, and, and, and then if it, if you don't succeed, pick yourself up and, uh, and, you know, try again. And, 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 ultimately, you know, if you, you know, if you're that determined, you will succeed in life. This is a major opportunity. This is a major lifetime event for you. In all of the years that I've been doing this, only one person has quit. Quit. Left. I've been amazed that there's only been one person, because some people and sometimes you really suffer. It's very tough. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing, and it's totally true. And the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, and you don't really love it, uh, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people, actually. If you really look at, 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 at the ones that uh, ended up you know, being successful, unquote, in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't, oftentimes it, it's the ones that are successful love what they did so they could persevere when, you know, when it got really tough. And, and the ones that, that didn't love it quit because they're sane. Right? Who would want to put up with this stuff if you don't love it? So it's a lot of hard work and, and it's a lot of worrying constantly. And uh, um, if you don't love it, you're going to fail. Make a choice. Right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. Because it's only about 1% of people have the ability to really take risks, entrepreneurial risks. 99% of the population can work for a business once it's established. Only 1% have the courage and the ability to actually make the entrepreneurial breakthroughs that create those jobs. Somebody said to me, what did you learn from your father? And what I learned from my father is that work can make you happy really can make you happy but you have to love what you do you're meeting your must my friends maybe it's time to change your must some people's must is to survive some people's must is to be okay some people's must is to have freedom some people's must is to have more than they could possibly spend some people's must is to take care of everybody around them whatever your must is you're going to get it think how your life would be different if you raise the standard of what you expected from yourself not your people yourself to that level how things could shift. It's all about changing your shoulds to must. It's all about going back and saying, this is how it's gonna be. Have an unfair advantage you know I went to war and at, at war I'm alive because other guys died for me when you see stuff like that you know how can I quit most guys are just wimps pussies cowards they don't have it you know in the beginning we went to every single label and every single label shut their door on us um, the, the genius thing that we did was we didn't give up The guy who is willing to hustle the most is going to be the guy that just gets that loose ball.
Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. We have had a few technical difficulties. We were having a little bit of a problem bringing in the uh, people from the Urban Tech Fair. So what we've decided to do, since we couldn't bring them in on camera, you're looking at who you're looking at right now is the beautiful Jacqueline Taylor Adams. And what we have done, we brought her in on telephone, and we're going to show her picture while she herself talks to you about the Urban Tech Fair. So, Jackie, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Hello. Hello. Okay, let me see if I can turn you up a little, say a few things. Go ahead Hello, and talk. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, hello, I'm, I'm Jacqueline Taylor, um, Taylor Adams, and I am the chairperson and chief marketing officer for the Urban Tech Fair. Mm -hmm. And the Urban Tech Fair is the brainchild of Jim Newson, also known as the Digital Drummer. And um, the Urban Tech Fair was developed with a focus on providing access, education, and driving commerce um, to urban communities. Uh, we, what we wanted to do that was different from everyone else, Jim just had a vision of, if anyone knows about Jim Newson as a digital drummer, for years he has provided advanced information on technology, things you may have never known, and he's always had since made it plain, made it accessible through a blog he's had. I think he started on Yahoo, you would sign up and you would get his blog. And from the years, it just progressed, um, progressed on various platforms. So now, um, so Jim just knows, like, you know what I mean? Let's Hello? Just basically create it. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, somebody else just came in on the line. Did someone else just come in on the line? Yes, this is Jim Newsom. Oh, hi, Jim. Jackie, can you hear Jim? Yes, I can. Okay, so the two of you, go ahead and share the platform. I'm so glad that you were able to join us, Jim, and I'm sorry that the Skype was not working for us this time. Well, or that, okay, but go ahead, talk. All right, well, I'll, I'll just bring Jim on, but it, um, Jim, you go ahead. Well, I, I'm, I, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of getting caught up. You were in the middle of a statement, Jackie, so go on and finish, and then uh, I'll fit in where I can. Okay. So I was just sharing with the people how you um, you have brought to life for years um, te technical information, um, um, history, like so many people who, um, African Americans, people of color who um, have done so much with technology, the, you know, internet, platforms, gaming. All of this different type of information and different ways to use technology for your business, for your community, you used to make accessible by your blog. And I was just, you know, making the next jump that when you created the Urban Tech Fair, it was almost like um, bringing alive and bringing to a city and to an area the same thing that you did online. And what we realize is, um, especially as the village grows, as we become more internal, we do get more into video games, not only are our children playing outside and all as, as much, we're not interacting with one another as much. And a lot of us are not aware of not just what's going on in our community, but who's in our community. Um, we know about all the bad things, but we don't real, a lot of times realize what phenomenal things are being done and in our community. So again, that's having access and knowledge of existing resources and people. Two doors from you could be a person who created an act that could change the world. And that's not, that's not an extreme statement. So in the Urban Tech Fair, what we want to do is provide access to this information and this knowledge that we already have you know, bring it to a, a street level. And then also to, to showcase all of these great nonprofits, these great people, and the great work that's actually being done in your community that you just may not realize. And then to drive commerce to our small businesses. 
and to our um, community organization to actually drive commerce. So the Urban Tech Fair, this was the idea, and then me as the chairperson and chief marketing officer, I helped you know develop the structure that would bring to light the idea. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jim, the actual creator, the okay. music. You know, that was uh, a, a great synopsis in terms of the, the roots of the Urban Tech Fair. Uh, because the Urban Tech Fair is about showcasing uh, community projects, organizations, and those that are out there volunteering and working in the neighborhood as we speak. You are fantastic people doing marvelous things with little or no resources, but yet all we hear on the media is the negative side the sensationalism and and the uh, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of the word it, 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 it's about keeping the status maintaining the status quo and our youth the kids are out there doing great things and looking around they're, they're very digital natives they, they, they've grown up with uh, digital technology they have no concept of paper and pencil as, as we did and, and our use. And so now as the world changes or evolves into a digital world and they're removing textbooks out of classrooms and the products of the future are no longer based on the uh, manual labor or uh, the uh, 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 traditional, traditional manufacturing or service industry, we must begin to develop new products, new goods and services and new markets in our own community. And that being said, there are so many people, such as LaDonna, that are out there working every day to achieve that goal, that get no recognition and their projects are totally underutilized. So the Urban Tech Fair is intended to showcase all the good works and all the good resources that are available in our own backyard. Our motto is Discover Silicon Valley in your own backyard. If Silicon Valley is about innovation and entrepreneurship, we're better to find it than in our community. We've been making something out of nothing for generations. It's not like we're broke. It's just a matter of the value proposition that we're putting in our community. Instead of spending uh, $300 for a, a, a purse or a pair of shoes, kidney shoes, we need to be encouraging our kids to spend $300 on creating a radio station or creating a, a mobile app or creating a video game. Amen. <laughs> you just got to amen. <laughs> so there's so many opportunities that are taking place. I put a post out there the, uh, the other day that there are more mobile devices on the planet today then there are humans on the earth. And when you consider that fact that there are over six billion humans here, and yet we have major uh, 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 continents such as uh, uh, Africa and South America, what they used to call third world countries, that are just now getting ele electricity, more or less wireless communication. Think of how that market can grow. <coughs> I often say that uh, technology is about creating the products of the mind. Those things that you can create in your imagination, manifest through technology, and then market and sell with the click of a button. And there's a fantastic whole new world opening up in terms of business opportunity and e-commerce. And we as a community have got to start looking up instead of looking down. And we've got to begin to pre prepare our children with the skills of the future so that our whole community will be uplifted. Even if it's only a few superstars, those superstars will again hire caterers, janitors, uh, you know, they'll be located in our community, they'll be about our community, and they'll be for our community. Definitely, yes. Yay. Yay. Thank you so much. You know, I, Jim, I really like everything that you're saying. This is Rita, Rita Moore. 
I really like everything that you're saying, and I wish that we could have um, gotten you on camera, uh, on the Skype, and brought you in. And I'm so sorry that Jackie's computer wasn't working. I'm just, I, I really want you to come back next time we do this because I like what you're saying. I'm going to myself look into the uh, digital drummer because uh, actually, until LaDonna told me about it, I had never heard of Urban Tech. So we need more of this. And, and in addition, I know you're in California, so it's quite early for you, and you got up and you came online, and I really, really do appreciate you coming by. Well, Ms. Moore, uh, LaDonna was on our radio show last week. We do a, a, a bi-monthly uh, uh, webcast on Blog Talk Radio, and she brags so much on you. <laughs> we got to have you on the show. Because that's what the Urban Tech Fair is about, making the community aware of people like yourself that are putting together programs, that are volunteering your time, that are providing our quality services in our neighborhood. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. That's why Public Access Producers Association has sponsored this event, because we realize that these access stations are in every city, every state. We need to take advantage of these stations. We need to put it out there. So we yes, need to and what you're saying is so key because if we don't tell our own story, then it will become his story and not our story. That's right. And there is a whole new movement. Uh, people don't realize that 90% of everything you read, hear, or see is controlled by six companies. The mega companies have controlled the information pipeline to the point where if you're watching NBC, all you hear about is NBC News. If you're watching Fox, all you hear about is Fox News and Fox Opinion. But you don't hear about community opinions. You don't hear about the kids that was uh, bullied on the corner and we all know them because we all live here, so we all know who the troublemakers are. That's right. But yet, we aren't able to use the media and communication to focus and inspire and motivate our community to take positive action. So uh, programs such as uh, public access, such as uh, webcasting, such as uh, uh, YouTube and video are key to us providing a new medium of information that we control as a community. Wow, you're absolutely yes. right. And like what I, what I would like to add to their formula, um, the other um, part of it is marketing and sharing information. Mm -hmm. um, so many times I work with smart organizations that say they're the best kept secret. That's not a good thing unless you're in intelligence in the military. <laughs> 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 It's not, you know, that's not a good tagline. And that's what makes the Urban Tech Fair so great. That's where, you know, Jim, you know, he's, um, we, we're really good partners. He, he spoke it and, and I see it. I'm, I'm a good systems person. I, I put systems in place and I can see it manifested. And that's what makes it so great because it takes place in your city. And um, first, all you, you can go to www.urbantechfair.org. And the Urban Tech Fair manifests as a 30-day interactive community-based cloud and ground experience. And so it um, happens in the clouds for the first three weeks, and it ends that at the end of that month. It ends as a seven-day on-the-ground event, right there, fair in your community. So it gives the opportunity for so many people to participate locally. And also for you then to have your community showcase, your local community to be showcased across the globe. So we just, um, if you're interested, we you go to www.urbantechfair.org and join. You can join various committees. You can join your city. You can join as a city leader. If you say, okay, my city's not on a list and I want my city to be there, I will lead my city. And then we just ask you to partner with the BDPA, that's our main sponsor, which is BDPA, and you can find them at bdpa.org, but they are the number one um, minority um, database processing association, and they are making great strides, great partnerships. 
You can go there to check their boards for jobs. Um, their youth camp and their youth programs are phenomenal. And um, but we are supporting with a BDA chapter in your area. If there's not one, any other local nonprofits to partner with, and to partner with a local college or university. Now you have your team, you have your core team, and you gather people together, and you just form a committee. And we have the structure, we give you the structure, okay, this will tell you how the event happens, what happens, what takes place. We have a few um, you know, dead things that take place, like one, one of the days there will be a digital town hall summit on um, technology in your community. Um, we have um, um, a, a breakfast where we talk about um, economic development and vertical paradigm. And, th and there's a, a great press conference. We, sh we show you, um, and we want this press conference to take place in the main ground activities to all activate from a commercial corridor within your community. So say if, if there's in a neighborhood, not in your downtown, we know we all have these fabulous downtowns or center parts of our cities, but is there an area in your community that's commercial, not residential, but your local bakery, um, nail salon, they have a, you know, maybe a couple of restaurants, daycare, a place like that, you know, an area that's a commercial entity where you may do some shopping in your neighborhood. Those are the places that we like to go in and actually put up a Wi-Fi cloud for the whole 30 days. So people, when they hit, the moment they hit near that area within a two to 10 mile radius of that area, that they can um, access Wi-Fi. And so now we're driving traffic down into the area. We want you to host your press conference, and we support you and tell you how to do this great press conference that you host there, but it's streamed globally. Again, it's, it's, it's bringing attention to our businesses. We're driving traffic. We're making, aware, we're making everything aware. Each city will have its own Urban Tech Fair website. And um, it's just an exciting venture. But I said it's not just that we're speaking this and we're not holding a conference in a room where there's 100 or so people attending and that's it. Because one of the core things, and I work with public officials throughout the years, cities and all get a little apprehensive when you say, I want to come into your city and do a conference. Okay, but what happens when you leave the conference? You come in, you make all these big promises to our children, to our community, and then you just leave. Hmm. So it's not just an issue about coming and holding something, but it's about an issue coming, getting everyone excited and organized to carry on something. Wonderful. What I'd like to say is about changing the uh, value proposition of technology in our community. Right now, most of us in studies show use our cell phones, our tablets, and our, our computers as entertainment devices, as another version of the Bluetooth, that we've got to begin to take these digital tools and use them as the picks and shovels of the gold mine of the future that's happening all around us. American pop culture sells as a premium anywhere on the planet. And American pop culture begins and ends in our community. The first time that I ever seen a, a sunroof on a car was when I was in Harlem and the pimps had cut holes in the middle of the Cadillac to put the bubble top. <laughs> Next thing you know, we start rolling around with, uh, uh, with pagers, and all of a sudden pagers blow up and become a major industry. We start getting involved in social networks such as Twitter, and now tweet, uh, uh, Twitter is one of the, the biggest social network platforms on the planet, and most people don't realize that 25 to 40 percent of the subscribers and the population on Twitter and Instagram are minorities. They're us, and we need to be talking to each other instead of talking to Wall Street and big box stores about how to take our money. Yes, and we need to change our um, our conversation instead of talking about one another, mm -hmm. speaking with one another, uplifting one another, and collaborating. Collaboration is really the key. Mm -hmm. 
um, one of those things that Jim said is start looking up. What's so key about looking up, we must begin to create vertical paradigms. Every ethnic group that exists corners some market except for African Americans. Hmm. We don't corner a market. In order to corner a market, you must move vertical in some industry. And um, so we have to stop any oakling one another. Anything you can do, I can do better. And look more at the proposition. How do we go from ideal idea to retail consumption to ownership within our community? And we become our own gatekeepers. Once we're on our gatekeepers, we can do business with anyone. But it's just it's key that we, um, in this instance, it's just extremely key that we move vertical instead of horizontal. So if someone has an idea, okay, you have the idea, how can we get it manufactured? Who in our community we can find and can manufacture it? Okay, we have the manufacturer. Now what distributors there are in our community? So can we the distributors now what retail outlets and then now you have created a vertical paradigm as opposed to only moving horizontal very good very good you know uh, uh, the Donna was telling me that um, I should ask you Jim about um, the Hollywood Did I digital miss Hollywood digital Hollywood yes what's that about Digital Hollywood is one of the major uh, tech events in the nation. I encourage all of us to get involved in different conferences and, and national uh, uh, conventions and shows. You can learn so much about your industry, whether it be the beauty industry, the audio industry, or the tech industry, by participating in uh, conferences and conventions. You're able to go to these events and pin and trap people in the corner, shake their hand and tell them their, your story, people who would never return your phone call. Hmm. For example, Digital Hollywood is a uh, event uh, that marries, marries uh, technology, Silicon Valley, and the Hollywood industry. All the major studio heads from Sony to uh, MGM, all of the studio heads have representatives there, as well as all the major tech companies, Google, Facebook, the manufacturers, Samsung. They were all there pitching their wares, talking about the future of what you will be seeing on TV and how TV and technology are going to interact to a second and third screen talking about the advantages of markets such as the Hispanic market, which is blowing up worldwide. One of the things that I found amazing at Digital Hollywood at the Hispanic Summit was that they were talking about millennials uh, taking over technology. You know, uh, we hear a lot about them. Well, one out of every four millennials is a person of Hispanic heritage. Think about that. One out of four. And if the youth control the direction of this country, they're about to be, uh, put a big message out there in terms of generating new types of dollars and new types of markets to South America. So what we're saying is that we as the African diaspora have the same ability, that Africa is the biggest market, mobile market on the planet. Uh, there are more cell phones in Africa than there are people in the United States. And Africa uh, representatives were there at Digital Hollywood talking about the programs such as uh, Google's Bloom program. Google is putting up these blips to provide free Wi-Fi in Africa. Well, hey, we need free Wi-Fi in our community as well. <laughs> so we, when you go to these events, you're able to catch these uh, uh, chief marketing officers, senior VPs, these decision makers in the hallways, and talk to them, shake their hands, put your card, tell them your story, and hopefully begin to network and generate business. You know, it's one thing I like to complain about what I call the uh, black tax. In other words, in the black community, 
our thing has always got to be two or three times better than the white man before we ever move out on faith. We have to have every T cross and every I dotted because so many of us, when we tell somebody about our ideas and share our hopes and dreams, they're looking to punch holes in them. And we feel that as long as somebody can punch holes in it, then we don't have it together. I can't tell nobody my idea. Somebody's going to steal it. I don't have everything together. But Silicon Valley is about what they call minimal viable product. Think about it. You ever know Windows to work? You ever know any Windows product to work properly? <laughs> what they do in Silicon Valley is they create a minimum product, a prototype, and then begin to market, sell it, and fix it on the fly. But we in our community feel that our product has to be perfect from day one before we begin to market, sell it, and get it out there to the general consumer. So the thing about conventions is that you're able to go to shows like Digital Hollywood and find out what they're working on, hear from universities, hear from major corporations, see what direction they're headed in, and try to get ahead of the curve in terms of creating and marketing your own product. Uh, Digital Hollywood is a four-day event, and in those four days that I spent out at the Ritz Carlton in Santa Monica, I was able to meet with the chief marketing officer of Samsung, of uh, Facebook, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, uh, the president of We Video, which is a, a, a video sharing uh, cloud sh sharing program, which allows you to create video on your phone and then edit it on the fly and distribute it worldwide has volunteered and is willing to work with us at the Urban Tech Fair for our video contest. When we come into a city, we're going to have a contest to see who can create a two minutes, the best two minute video of what technology is in your community. We video, that's W-E-V-I-D-O, is the perfect platform to be able to create a, a video MOV file off of your phone and then edit it cut it, add music, add text, and everything, and then upload it to all the, all the major platforms such as YouTube and so forth. So these are the type of things that, that you learn at conventions and shows such as Digital Hollywood. And Digital Hollywood happens three times a year here in California at CES uh, in Las Vegas, and then I believe uh, in the, uh, the summer in New York City. So that's digitalhollywood.com. If you go there, you'll be able to see the unbelievable amount, amount of executives and 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 and, and uh, tech people and brands uh, that participated. And Jackie and 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 Maria, and Ms. Moore, let me highlight to you a program that Samsung, one of the biggest manufacturers of, of, of home electronics just announced at Digital Hollywood. They're putting together a women's mentoring program, specifically to marry up young entrepreneurs with established executives in the tech industry to mentor them, help them develop new products, and help get more women involved in technology and on executive levels in entertainment. You can find out more details at digitalhollywoodwomensummit.com. Wow, I didn't know anything about that. That's wonderful. The other key thing about what Jim is saying for Digital Hollywood, CES, and a lot of other tech conferences, that they're very affordable. You know, because there are some specialty conferences, that, like in my industry, in the industry of sponsorship, it's three thousand dollars to attend a conference. And um, but these are so much. They're actually affordable. There's some sessions that are free, so you that's know that's like. what's great about it. And just to let everyone know, the Urban Tech Fair is free to the public, so people would be able to attend and interact and be part of the Urban Tech Fair at no cost. But we will be beginning a membership drive, and with your membership, that will give you some special um, privileges and additional access that the general public may not have. Let me ask you, how can we, uh, public access, support 
Urban Tech Fair? Well, um, the main way you can um, support, we will sit down and talk about a great collaboration, how we can support one another, um, definitely support the movement of public access, um, and we will sit down and look at what our goals are and how we can best support one another. And another great way is you can provide, We part of the Urban Tech Fair, part of that 30 days is um, a virtual conference. So definitely we can provide an opportunity for you guys to do, you know, three days um, to have um, programming on for three right. days during a virtual conference. That would be and great. Yeah, and, and what would, another great way would be for the public access to lead up an urban tech fair in Richmond, Virginia. You know what, that's you not know, We can come down there and go to King's Dominion. <laughs> <laughs> We can talk about that. We will, I will be in touch. I have your information. I will be in touch. I am so glad that we were able to find a way to get you guys online. I mean, I would have really been disappointed not to have heard all of this wonderful information. I thank you both so, so much. Are there any last closing words that you'd like to say, Jim or Jackie? Well, first, I'd just like everyone to visit us, and then I'm going to hand it over to you, Jim, to for everyone to go to www.urbantechfair.org, click on the join button and join because um, it's you that's going to make the difference. And, when you, and join and volunteer. We do need support. It's a volunteer effort, and we need whatever help we can get. And just volunteer what, wherever your passion is. That's where we would love for you to volunteer. Jim? Uh, as, as I think so often, the Urban Tech Fair is a movement of the people, for the people, and by the people. In the spirit of Ubuntu, we are, because of all of you, because of people like yourself and LaDonna that are working in the community who are there to support, share, enhance, and showcase the best of our neighborhood. So join us, give us information, tell us how we can best serve you, because the secret of Silicon Valley is collaboration. And we're looking to collaborate and work with communities and organizations all across the country. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you both so much for, for coming in and talking to us online. And we'll be keeping in touch, okay? Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you for the hosting this great event. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. The last participant has left the conference. This call is being call recording off. Okay, guys, we've just heard from Jim Newsom, and uh, what I'm going to do now is put on that video one more time, just one more time. In fact, now I have a guest. Come on, come on up here. Come on, come on up. I know you guys can't see me. I'm trying my best, but we have a young lady in the audience who was sharing with me what she and her husband do. They have a ministry, and while we're getting ourselves together for the next speaker, I'd like her to just come up and share with you a few things that she told me about the ministry that she and her husband have. Come on up. What's Hi, your name? Vicki Waters. Vicki Waters. Go ahead, Vicki, talk. Thank you so much, <laughs> Rita. I appreciate that. I'm really not prepared, but you know, you got to always be ready. Yes, sir. Um, I, my husband and I have been married for 28 years, and one of the things that we have found out is that a lot of times you will ask people, um, how long have you been married? And they'll tell you, but the question is, do they enjoy being married? And so it's one thing to say that you love your spouse, but do you enjoy your spouse? And so our ministry is called Health and Wealth, and that stands for husbands enjoying and loving their helpers, and wealth is wives enjoying and loving their husband. 